Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 23, hearing the voice of, of God, listen and hear my voice, pay attention and hear what I say. This sounds like something Jesus promised in John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, when he spoke, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Do we understand? Can we hear him? He is promising that we can hear his voice and that in hearing his voice, we can follow him. Do you know one of the most oft-repeated refrains of Jesus was, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> it's, I guess we could loosely translate this. Listen up, if you can. Pay attention. Hear what I say. You've heard people say that God gave us two ears and only one mouth. And the reason is so that we could listen twice as much as we speak. But there's another explanation. He knew it would be twice as hard for us to listen as it would be to speak. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, you may not remember readily at this time that that idea of having ears to hear is repeated by our Lord himself again. And it's repeated more times in the book of Revelation than he did it in his earthly ministry, at least insofar as the gospel record is concerned. And here we read in Revelation 2, 7, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, he says that after he talks to Ephesus. He says that after what he has to say to Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I would suggest to you today that he is still saying that to Rockadine Road. He who has an ear, <laughs> let, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Can you hear the voice of God? Of course, you can hear the voice of God. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our fathers in various ways and at different times. But hath in these last days spoken to us through his Son. God primarily speaks to us through his word, through, through the Bible. He's not limited to that. But if we're receiving information that we think is from God and it doesn't line up with what's in the scriptures, then we're being misinformed. Other voices are speaking to us, perhaps our own or the enemy's. But you can hear the voice of God and it's primarily through the voice of Jesus as we read in the scriptures. But our God speaks. And you say, well, I know he did. He, he said to Adam, all of this is yours in this garden. You can do anything you want here. Dress it, take care of it, the animals, but don't eat that tree. We believe that. We believe that he said, Noah, build an ark. Spoke directly to him. We believe that he spoke directly to Jonah. And he said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to that great city. I know they're enemies, but there's 100,000 people there that I'm going to have to destroy for their wickedness. And they need an opportunity to repent. Jonah, you go. Now we know that maybe Jonah heard what God said, like we hear what God says, but did he listen to what God said? Really in the Bible, obedience is called hearing. And if you're not obedient to what God says, you haven't really, you could not be said to have heard. But does God speak like that today? We know that from the passage before in Hebrews that he normally speaks through his son as he said in the time past he normally spoke through the prophets hey but we noticed already several instances where he spoke directly to people not through the prophets although speaking through the prophets was the normative way and similarly today 
Speaking through Jesus is the normative. We would expect to hear from God when we open his word and we read the words that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Do you hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? But God is not limited by the scriptures as was pointed out this week in Jumpstart. He speaks to us through events. He speaks to us through wise counsel and Christian friends. It can be the other way too. And he speaks to us through the word and through our own heart. Our God speaks. I, I want to pause just a moment to say that I think there's been a misunderstanding by many of us in the churches of Christ. You know, we've been accused of not believing in the Old Testament. Of course we believe in the Old Testament. But we believe that the Old Covenant was done away in some regard in the sense that Jesus' New Testament and the book of Hebrews talks about this has become effective. Uh, and so when we think about it, what has been nailed to the cross was that law of ordinances that was contrary to us. The Bible says he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now stay with me. I'm just saying that there are some things about the Old Testament that have been abrogated or taken away. Okay, the fact that animal sacrifices were done, that's been taken away. A lot of those ordinances, the fact that no one could come to God and, and be justified fully by the blood of Jesus prior to the actual shedding of his blood, all that's true about the Old Testament. And it says that he took that law out of the way and nailed it to the cross. But wouldn't you agree with me that there are a great many things in the Old Testament that are just as true today as they were then? Hmm? Wouldn't you agree, or would you, that the early churches... New Testament was the Old Testament. Did you know that for many, many years, only Jews were Christians, and their only document was the Old Testament? The book of Christians was the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. It was in process of being written. And in some cases, a full 40, 50, 60 years, some portions of the Bible were not available to the church. That means that you could have lived and died very easily in the first century church and never read the book of Revelation. Have you, did you know that? You could have lived and died in the New Testament church and perhaps not, not read one of the Gospels that had not yet been written from the time that Jesus died in A.D. 33, 34, and the church began there on Pentecost. Peter told people to repent and be baptized for remission of sins. The church began. All they had was the Old Testament. So do you think they just threw it away? You think they just said, well, now this is no longer relevant. Uh, forget about the Psalms. We don't need those. Well... Those were actually their songs and have continued down through the centuries to be our songs because God does not change. And many things in the Old Testament are perfect revelation of what God does and who he is. They're written for our learning. And so when you chose Isaiah 28, 23 about listening to God, there may have been some that says, why are you using an Old Testament passage? Well, that would have meant a great deal to early Christians. We can listen to God. We can pay attention to God. God will speak to us. But we don't really need someone to teach us, according to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. You have an anointing. It remains in you. You do not need anyone to teach you, but his anointing teaches you all about things. And as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you remain in him. What is he saying here? That we don't need prophets in the church? Well, obviously not. That would counteract other plain teachings when he said he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be teachers. What he's saying is that concerning these false teachers, you don't have need that they come in and teach you. The Spirit has already revealed through the teaching and through your prophets what is true about Jesus, that he did come in the flesh and that he did die. But the point here that we're making today is that God teaches us. He still speaks to us, not just in the Old Testament. The early Christians would have been carrying around an Old Testament if they could. They would have been carrying around scrolls. And they'd say, where's your Bible? And they'd say, here, here, here it is. Let's see if we can find something. That was the early church. And it continued this way. And even as, as books were written by Paul and by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not every church had all of them. Each church had a few, a collection. And so any idea that our faith depends upon a minute, a minutia, interpretation of all of the New Testament in order to go to heaven. What happened to all those people in the first century who were Christians who had the Old Testament as their Bible? I'm expanding our mind today to say it isn't that God spoke in the past and he doesn't speak anymore. The Christians that became Christians in Acts chapter 2 would have just gone right on thinking that they serve a God who speaks. 
The stories of the Old Testament would be their stories. They would still be their stories. They would be rejoicing that Jesus died for their sins and that they were freed from sin in an absolute sense, that they no longer had to go offer animal sacrifices. But they wouldn't have thrown out their Bible. They would have accepted all the things that the Bible says that God did. And they would have expected him to continue to do that. And that's why the Hebrew writer says to those Jewish Christians, he spoke primarily through prophets, not only, but primarily, and now he speaks through his son. Jesus has promised each Christian the normative experience of hearing God. We hear God through events, we hear God through other Christians, through our prophets and teachers, through the Bible when we read it, and through our own spirit as God communicates as we carefully compare what we're thinking. What's being revealed in our spirit to what the Bible actually says. Every good conversation starts with listening. Want to have a relationship with God? Listening is the beginning of prayer. Sometimes my prayers are no more than a pity party. That I'm just holding by myself. Lord, you see this. Lord, help me. Lord, I need this. There's nothing wrong with that. But what about listening? And I, I, I think sometimes God must say, you know, Denny, if you just shut up and quit praying for a minute and pray by listening, I've got a lot to say. The truth is, the times that I've done that, I've heard a lot. I've really had God open my heart to a fact. And you know, you know what happens when you hear the voice of God? I'm not talking about Denny, build an ark. But when through his Holy Spirit he communicates with your spirit, do you, know, do you know what the first reaction is when you see a truth? When you understand something about your life you didn't understand before. The first reaction is not, well, God just spoke to me, I just want you to know. And now I know something that I never knew before and it's pretty cool, let me share it with you because I'm wonderful. Now, now here's what happens. How could I have been so stupid? and not shut up a long time ago and listen to God wow it's humbling it's humbling it took me this long to get this message it's like my cup is full and God can't add anything to it I'm bubbling out and he says if you'd settle down just a minute I, I could pour a little something in there we've all had that experience especially with pop that's shaken up or something you can pour it you have to wait how many of you like that experience? How many of you are patient? You just love doing that. Don't you? Wait. Is Diet Pepsi the worst? Just a minute, I'll add ice. We don't like that. And we're no different when it comes to listening to God. We're pouring out and we're saying, no, I, I've got more to pour out. We don't like the listening part. Why can't we hear? Well, our ears are closed. We're dull of hearing, the Bible says. In, in Revelation, he said to that Ephesian church, they left their first love. I want you to remember how it was when you were dating somebody. Some of you have to remember a while. How was that? Were they talking away and you were going, <laughs> you know? Sometimes I do that to my friends. When they're talking on and on, I just go. <laughs> they say, that's very rude. <laughs> it is, but it's fun. <laughs> but you were driving down the road. You were with your date. And they were talking and you were hanging on every single word. Now, now it's different, isn't it? Huh? Oh, were you talking? <laughs> Let me, let me turn down the TV if you got something you really have to say. Let me, okay, what is it? You know, and the book, in the book of Revelation, the church at Ephesus, they had wandered away from their first love. And he says, you need to open your ears and listen to what the Spirit is saying. We can take God for granted too. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. Dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. So to speak and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. Did you know that word moral filth comes from a Greek word which is akin to wax ear buildup? 
seriously. You can't hear. And he says, and then you can, you can go ahead and humbly accept the word of God. That's an interesting thought to me. An arrogant mind cannot hear. How many of you identify with arrogance? You know? You're good at what you do. Somebody else comes into your purview. <laughs> you're a rookie. You know, I mean, we, we can become arrogant. And if we're arrogant, then God uh, does not reveal to us. In Luke chapter 2, in verse 46 and 47, we find that Jesus is in the temple. And after three days, his parents found him there, sitting among the teachers, listening. Hmm. And asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. The world is still amazed. But he spent time listening to people he created and asking them questions. Sometimes we come before other people and we say, I've got a lot to share with this person. Shut up and I'm going to tell you how the cow eats the cabbage. Jesus didn't do that. He listened. He asked questions. And then they were amazed as his answers. I wonder sometimes why people aren't so amazed at my answers. It's probably because I'm answering questions that they don't have. He listened and he asked them questions. He found out where they were. I think we come before God with an arrogant mind and we don't have the humility to receive. And so God just says, hmm. I knew a guy one time who was very hard of hearing. And what he did to cover this was agree with everything that was said. It was very, very interesting. How are you doing? Where have you been? Yes. Well, um, where are you going now? I am, yes. Yes. And are you a crazy person? Yes. No, no. Very nice person, but had found a way to communicate without being able to hear. And we understand that, and we actually feel sorry for those of us that are getting a little hard of hearing. We're not making fun of that. But when it comes to spiritual things, we can become members of a church and come to a church, and, and God says something, we say, yes. Yes, of course. And God says something else into our lives, and we say, yes, yes. But we, but we really are not listening because we can't hear it. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it at all. We want to maintain the illusion that we're able to listen when, in fact, we're not. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, God's will that you should be sanctified and avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Yes. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save or his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Well, if God is not listening to us, he's certainly not speaking to us. And if we're not listening to him, why should he? Sometimes we're dismissive to God. God does not speak to be heard. He speaks to be obeyed. In verse 23 in James chapter 1, first in 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 7. Moses took the book of the covenant and read it to the people and they responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Deuteronomy 6 verses 3 and 4. The Shema. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your fathers promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord 
is one. Obedience is hearing. Lack of obedience is not listening. It's not hearing, even though we might recite the words. And so the question I pose as I begin to close this morning is, are you listening? God speaks to those who want to hear what he has to say and who want to do what he wants. In Psalm chapter 40, verses 7 and 8, Then I said, Here am I. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Are you wondering if God is speaking? What is your attitude toward what he says? Sometimes we want more, and God says, what about what you already have? We're kind of like the guy who said, if I had $10 million, I'd give a million to the church. Well, that's real generous of you. What about the $100 you have now? Would you give 10 Obedience is the key to hearing more. But remember, there's more than one voice out there. There is the voice of the enemy. Remember the parable of the soil. The seed is the word of God. Luke 8 and verse 11. A man went forth to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and took the seed away before it could be implanted in the soil. He says that bird is representing the devil who speaks other things into our hearts, takes away the word of God. We can deceive ourselves. We can think that we don't need anything further. Do you remember Lillian Carter? Jimmy Carter's been in the news lately uh, because of his cancer. We wish him well. But his mother, Lillian, was interviewed several years ago. And they said, what was Jimmy like as a little boy? And she said, oh, he was a perfect boy. He never told a lie. I think she was trying to horn in on the Washington story. I expected to hear something about a cherry tree or something. But she said he never told a lie. And the reporter pressed her a little bit. You mean he never told a lie at all? She said, oh, well, he told white lies, but he never really lied. We can deceive ourselves uh, you know, about how good we are and, and our lack of a need for any further instruction. Some people think they've got enough and, and teaching and hearing prophetic voices and reading the scriptures is above and beyond what, what they need to do anymore. They've, they've gone above it. Um, have you ever said glad to see you when you didn't mean it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hope it wasn't this morning. No, we can deceive ourselves and, and have a lack of humility. But if it is the voice of the Lord, let me tell you how I think you can tell. First of all, that voice will cheer you up. That voice will give you peace. That voice may affect courage, but it also may change you so that peace can come. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, we know that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord, are called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So we become more like Jesus through the voice of Jesus, through his teaching, and that results in a change. So the voice of, of God brings peace, it cheers us, it gives us courage, like the time God appeared to, to Paul when he was in Corinth and said, be of good courage, I have many people in this city. And so he, he bucked up and he stayed in there and, and he uh, established a great church. But I believe also the voice of God, if you really want to listen to it, and this is where it really gets hard for me and I suspect for a great many people. The word of God very seldom is just hang out. Now, there's a time for that. Jesus took a rest, and he said, you need to come apart and rest. I like that translation because if you don't rest, you're going to come apart. So he goes out and he rests. There is a time to hang out. But the voice of God very seldom says, just chill. There's usually a challenge associated through our periods of time. We may be in a valley and he may be trying to encourage us, cheer us. We may be in a wrong direction. He may be trying to change us and correct us. But in our normative experience, here's why I have trouble listening. Because it's usually a challenge. It's a challenge. That's why we started in the book of Revelation with those letters to the churches. Those churches were kind of just hanging out. They didn't want to accept the challenges that the difficulties around them were presenting. And so they were just going along to get along. 
they were saying, yeah, I, I hear, yes, yes, yes. But Jesus says, no, you're not. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. That's the area of difficulty that I have, I'll just confess. Because the Lord challenges me many times to do something, and I don't pick up that, that challenge. I don't listen. I don't really hear. How about you? I think that would be the challenge this morning. To listen to the challenges, to the things that would move you out of your comfort zone. To serve the Lord in a way that you're just not hanging out. When the Lord comes, may he find us not only watching, as he said, but listening. Matthew 7, 24 and 25 will close. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock.